in my structural engineering made simple series. Today I talk about composite beam system design. Please take a moment and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this slide before we continue. Composite beam systems are made up of steel beams and concrete slabs with or without supporting metal decking. Such systems are also equipped with elements called shear connectors or shear studs that help transfer shear forces between concrete slab and steel beams. Composite beam systems are popular as floor systems in buildings and also in bridges. Design for a composite beam system includes proper selection of the steel beam the slab thickness and shear studs. Shear studs are generally headed bars or pieces of channels that are welded to the top flange of the steel beam. Here is an example of a composite beam system. As you can see, there in this special case, a corrugated metal decking is used to support the concrete during construction the concrete is reinforced. Metal studs are used in here. These are shear connectors. And of course, there is a steel beam and shear connectors are welded to the top flange of this beam. These figures show the cross section of slabs and beams, which are typical in highway bridges. In these details, there are usually no metal decking. And the slab thickness is about 7 to 10 inches. Please note that we are using the following reference in the preparation of this video. AIAC 2005, a Steel Construction Manual, 13th edition, published by the American Institute of Steel Construction. Also notice that if shear connectors are not used, the system is not a composite beam. In that case, the steel beam is designed without the contribution of strength from the concrete slab. The slab design and its reinforcement is not covered in this video. The slab design follows the procedures of the American Concrete Institute, ACI. Please watch my Structural Engineer Meet Simple series, Lesson 9, which talks about design of reinforced concrete one-way slabs. If the construction of the composite beam system is done without shoring support, then the adequacy of a design of the system will need to be verified for two stages of loading. These are during construction. In this case, the steel beam alone must be able to carry the dead load of the slab and its self-weight and without a slab contribution. Also, deflection of the beam will need to be checked to make sure it is limited to no more than 2.5 inches for proper placement of concrete. After the system is completed and concrete has reached its required strength, the system acts as a composite structure with the steel and concrete work together, now carrying all the loads, dead load and live load both. The live load deflection after the construction and with the composite beam action is limited to L over 360 when L is the span length. Visual design configuration. Generally, the geometry of the composite beam system is known. In other words, the following geometrical dimensions are decided based on the experience and or overall dimensions and configuration of the structure. This includes the following information and dimensions. The thickness of the slab. If metal decking is used, the deck configuration, including the height of the rib, HR, and its width. Now, if, for example, we have a corrugated metal decking, we are talking about HR as a height, 
and WR as a width. The orientation of the metal decking with respect to the steel beam, whether the deck is running perpendicular to it or parallel to it. The spacing between steel beams. Therefore, design generally involves deciding on an appropriate size for the steel beam, the type and number of shear connectors, and the serviceability check. In other words, making sure the deflection is controlled. A conservative design may be performed without design aids. However, generally, it is advised that design tables of the AIAC be utilized for proper design. In any case, it is important to know how to compute the moment resistance of the composite section and how to compute the number of shear connectors needed. Depending on the number of connectors used, a full composite or partial composite action may be achieved. We're going to talk about this later. Design method. In this video, the design method is based on the LRFD process using the provisions of and design tables in the AIAC manual. Since generally the composite beam systems in buildings are designed for floor loads, the following two load combinations are considered in computing the factor applied moment MU and factor shear VU. 1.4 times the dead load, usually this is during construction. 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load, usually this is after the composite action has taken place. For roofs, if a snow load is more critical than the live load, the load combination will be for the dead load and the snow load with considerations for potential snow drift on the roof. The snow drift would create some sort of trapezoidal or triangular distribution for the snow load. General configuration. This figure illustrates the general configuration of a composite system and the dimensions. As you can see here, the distance between the exterior beam and the edge of the slab is designated as SE. The spacing between the beams is S prime or S. Now it could be the same or could be different. That's what I use S prime and S. When it comes to deciding on the effective width of the slab, because not the entire width of the slab is considered, for the exterior beam, the effective width is B prime. For the interior is B. And let's see how we can compute them. B prime is a minimum of the edge distance, SE, and one half of the spacing, which in this case is S prime, and SE plus one eighth of the span length. L is the span length of the beam. However, for an interior beam, B is a minimum of half of the spacing from one side plus half of the spacing from the other side and a quarter of the length of the beam. Also notice that in this configuration, we have designated the height of the metal decking as HR. And if there is no metal decking, then of course HR is equal to zero. We need to know the thickness of the slab T and the properties of the section of the steel beam, including the width of the flange, thickness of the flange, thickness of the web, and so on. Computing moment resistance. When the slab dimensions and beam size are known, the computation for the maximum bending resistance can be done based on the plastic stress distribution across the cross-section. Please note that certain requirement on the web slenderness ratio need to be satisfied, as I'm going to talk about later, so that we can use the plastic stress distribution. 
The nominal bending strength is designated as Mn. The factor of the strength is 5b multiplied by Mn. 5b in this case is 0 0.9. It is the resistance reduction factor. The design equation is based on the inequality mu smaller or equal to 5b mn, where mu, as you realize, is the factored applied moment, and mn is a nominal resistance. There is a similar equation for shear. But in this video, we are not talking about shear. I'll just make a reference to it. This procedure for computing the moment resistance is for cases when W sections are used as beams, for which the following equation is satisfied. This is H over TW. This is the slenderness of the web, and it is smaller than 3.76 times the square root of E over FI. E is the modulus of elasticity of steel, and FI is the yield capacity of steel, which is for W sections is 50 KSI. The parameter H is the flat portion of the web, as you can see here, is D minus two times K. And these values are all listed in the AIC manual for different sections. For W sections, this inequality is always satisfied. In cases when H over TW is larger than that limit, AIC requires using superposition of elastic stresses with the effect of shoring for the limited states of yielding. The moment resistant in this case is the yield moment. And uh, there is a procedure for computing the moment resistance. Usually you need to use what we call transformed beam. And I'll talk about that towards the end of my video briefly talk about how you can find the transformed section and get the properties of the section accordingly and compute the moment resistance. Depending on the section configuration and the strength of concrete, three cases are possible. Case one, the plastic neutral axis PNA is within the concrete slab. Case two, the PNA is within the top flange of the beam. Case three, the PNA is within the web of the beam. For a given composite section, we can find out which condition governs. To do that, first we need to compute the maximum compression force on concrete, I call it Cmax, and the maximum tension in a steel beam, we call it Tmax, Cmax and Tmax. So here is the configuration. As you can see here, the dimensions are given. In this condition, when we want to find the Cmax, we are considering the entire slab is under compression with the stress of 0 0.5 of prime sub C. And the entire steel section is yielded with the yield capacity Fy. Therefore, Cmax is simply the area of concrete, which is B times T multiplied by 0.85 of prime sub C. And for the Tmax is the area of a steel multiplied by Fy. If prime sub C is the compressive strength of concrete, usually around 4 KSI or 3 KSI. Fy, as I said, yield the strength of a steel or yield capacity of a steel, which is 50 KSI for W sections. And AS is a cross-sectional area of a steel, which is in the square inches. Now, if you're talking about an existing, let's say, floor system, which is uh, 50 years old or maybe 40 years old, and you are computing the strength of the composite section, chances are the W sections that are used have an FI of 36 KSI. So you need to know from the marking on the sample or the beam what kind of yield capacity they have. But most current steels, W sections, have 50 KSI of yield strength. Case one is when Tmax is smaller than Cmax. What happens if Tmax is smaller than Cmax? 
Well, that means the smaller compression force is needed to balance with the tension. Therefore, the PNA would move up. So PNA would be within the slab. Let's look at the configuration. So here is a situation. You notice that the area which is shaded by red, that's where the compression force is. Now the compression force is C, is smaller than C max. However, the tension force is still AS multiplied by Fy. You notice that the depth of the compression is shown with a little A, and the location when the force C applies is halfway from the top in distance A. In other words, is at A over two from the top. However, just following the AIAC procedures, we identify two dimensions, Y1 and Y2. Y1 is a distance between the plastic neutral axis P and A to the top flange of the steel beam. And Y2 is a distance between the location when the compression force C applies to the top flange of the beam. So in this special case, Y1 and Y2 are slightly different from each other. This line in here is the centroid of the steel beam. And in this video, I'm going to use that one as my reference point. Although depending upon the values of the load and the uh, location of PNA, the plastic uh, neutral axis may be, as you can see here, way up or way down, but uh, the resultant for the tensile forces not always fall under this line. So I'll talk about it later and you will see what is involved but you can very conveniently use this line as your reference line in computing your moment for uh, finding the MN. All right, so as I said, Y1 and Y2 are the two dimensions that uh, we are following the AIC manual for those. And uh, just looking at the geometry, we notice that therefore Y1 is HR plus T minus A. However, Y2 is HR plus D minus A over 2. Because T is equal to T max is AS over FI. With the balance of forces, writing in other words, the tension equal to compression, we can get an equation for A. A is equal to T, which is AS FI, divided by 0.85 prime sub C B. The lever arm is D over 2 plus Y2. Remember that I said the centroid of the steel beam is my reference point. Therefore, the moment is simply T times D over 2 plus Y2, or if you want to substitute for Y2, this is the equation you get for the moment resistance. So a pretty straightforward in this case. Then the next question is, how many shear connectors I need? For that, we need to find the horizontal shear force at the top flange, because that's where the shear connectors are connected to the steel. And uh, for that, uh, again, from the plastic stress diagram, and you can simply start from the bottom of the section and go up and find out how much force you have in this special case. Uh, you notice that, therefore, the total force is AS times Fy. And uh, AIC uses the designation sigma QN. Sigma QN is the horizontal shear at the top of the flange. We need that shear to compute how many shear connectors we have. So if the resistance of one shear connector is QN, just one, therefore the total number would be the shear force sigma QN multiplied by QN, right? Now, sometimes you use double starts, two together. In that case, of course, usually we need to multiply the QN by two when we put it in this equation. So I'll demonstrate that for you in an example problem later. Shear connectors are distributed at equal spacing between the point of zero moment to the maximum moment. 
And pay, please note that point of zero moment to point of maximum moment is actually where the shear is zero and shear becomes maximum. So uh, for a simply supported beam, this would be from one end of the beam to the mid span of the beam, right, for half of the beam. Also, please note that AIAC has certain limitations on the size and the spacing of shear connectors, as we explained later in this video. And also, there is some requirement on the height of the connectors. The connectors need to be about one and a half inches, at least above the top of the metal decking, if metal decking is used. And the concrete cover needs to be at least one and a half inches above the top of the shear connector. All right, now if T max becomes larger than C max, the plastic neutral axis is within the steel beam, whether in the top flange of the beam or in its web. Now, uh, let me talk about why we get into this situation first. Sometimes the beams are much stronger than the slab. For certain reason, we have to use a very strong beam and very small slab, so this condition may happen. Other areas that this condition may happen is when we don't have the full composite action. We just have partial composite action. And in that case, it all depends on how many shear connectors you use. The less number of shear connectors uh, cause the partial a composite action. Now, if you need to have a complete discussion on full partial composite action or partial or full composite action or partial composite action, I suggest that you look at the textbook in a steel design. So uh, let's look at case two when P and A now is in the steel beam, however, is in the top flange of the steel beam. And this is the pertinent diagram that shows the distribution of plastic stresses. Now you notice that the concrete slab right now is completely loaded because the PNA is much below. A small portion of the top flange of the beam is now under compression. A red shaded area means compression. So we have a 4C. And we have a little 4C sub C, which is the compression on a steel, C sub S rather. So C sub S. Why do I put two C sub, C sub S? I'll talk about that later. And uh, for the tension force, I put ASFI, but it's actually not ASFI because not the entire beam is under tension. A small portion at the top is under compression. Therefore, I need to deduct from ASFI an equal amount CS to have the total force. However, for the convenience, in order to use the beam centroid, I still use ASFI. And that CS that I need to deduct from this, I put it up here. That's what I get two CS. So this is how I would show the diagram, and I think the computation of MN is much easier. But there is another way that most textbooks talk about it. I'll tell you about it later. Now you notice that Y2 is changed because it's from the top of the flange to the center of this slab because that's where the load C applies. And the Y1, which shows the location of PNA, is a small y1 is the distance from top flange to pna all right so the distance between 4c and if we use our reference line as beam centroid that is d over 2 plus y2 We're keeping that in mind and let's now continue with our calculations and uh, uh, I also introduce a new parameters called C flange, and that is the compression force if the entire flange were under compression. But you notice not the entire flange is under compression. It's just a portion of it. But if the entire flange is under compression, I can find that value very easily. I call it C flange. Okay, so what is C flange? 
that would be the width of the flange times thickness of the flange multiplied by fi. Keep it handy. We'll come back to this later. So remember that I said the tension for the ASFI minus CS. But why, why am I using the absolute value of CS? Well, it doesn't matter. You can simply use CS. The reason I'm using absolute value is because some people would like to use a sign convention for compression and tension. And I just want to say that do not use any sign for CS. Just use the same value as CS that you get. That's the only purpose. All right. Now, as I said, CS is to account for the fact that a small portion of the ceiling at the top is under compression. Therefore, the tension on a steel is a maximum value ASFI deducted by an amount which is equal to CS. So, writing the equilibrium, compression forces is equal to tension forces, getting rid of the absolute value signs and sign, uh, so solve rather this equation for CS, you get the value of CS computed. Is ASFI minus 0.85 of prime sub CBT, that's the compression force, C, divided by 2. All right. So with this, now we compare it with the C flange. If CS that we just computed is smaller than C flange, that means PNA is in the top flange of the beam. And we can very easily find, therefore, that Y1 that we were looking for, the CS divided by BF, that's the width of the flange, and FY. And now I have both Y1 and Y2. Y2 is HF plus T over 2 because the point of application of the compression is at T over 2. And take the moment with respect to that reference line I told you about. So you get the force C multiplied by D over 2 plus Y2, 2 times CS multiplied by D over 2 minus Y1 over 2. Where is this Y1 over 2 involved? Because the center of the application of CS is right at the center of the little area. And don't forget that C is equal to this value. So with that, the only other things left to determine is what is that horizontal shear? Horizontal shear now is sigma QN, which is ASFI minus 2 CS, because the tension force is ASFI minus CS, and there is another CS as a compression, so we get 2 CS in there. Again, if you want to find this and don't want to memorize any equation, just to start from the bottom and add all the forces. Once you hit the top flange of the steel, that's where you have the shear force. And by the way, this is based on plastic stresses. The traditional equation VQ over BI for horizontal shear stress, that is applied to elastic condition, not to this. For this one, you need to use this value. And uh, I told you there is an, uh, another way of showing the diagram which most textbooks use. So uh, in that case, uh, what we do, we find another parameter which is called Y3. And uh, for computing that, we use the actual tension force, which is ASFI minus CS. And then we try to resolve all the vectors that show forces to figure out where is the exact location of this ASFI CS. It is not at the centroid of the steel. So it is uh, different from that location, but we can find it. So let me show you the diagram and see how the diagram would look like in this case. Well, you might say this is exactly like before. No, it is not, because you notice that I only have one CS in here, and I use this deduct this CS from ASY. This is the actual T, and you notice it is not in this location. It is lower, and it's actually at the distance Y3 to the top flange. So this is what I'm looking for. How do I find this? Well, you resolve, you know, you know from the statics, you have a bunch of vectors parallel to each other. You can find the resultant of those and you can find the exact location. So if you work your calculations, you come up with an equation for Y3. And in that case, we use this point as a reference point to find the moments with respect to this point, And we get this equation for MN. You get exactly the same value as before. If you look at a textbook in a steel design, you probably see this equation. 
But I think the previous one is easier, as long as you understand why it is 2CS. All right. Now, if CS is larger than C flange, obviously that means the PNA is now moving further down. The PNA is in the web of the steel beam. And uh, I'm going to introduce two new parameters. One is CF. Actually, this CF is the same as uh, C flange. This is the compression force in the flange of the beam. It's the same as this value. I'm going to introduce a new value called CW, which is the compression force in the web of the beam, that uh, a little area that is under compression. Let me show you a diagram. You will see it much better what's going on. Very similar to the previous diagram, except that it is a small portion here, which is under compression. And I'm going to use a new parameter Y3 to show you that what is this area? In other words, uh, to what extent this compression has gone into the web? That's the PNA. So similar to before, if I use ASFI, show it at the centroid. Then rather than a CW, I have two CW, and rather than CF, I have two CF, because the actual tension is ASFI minus CF minus CW. Very really similar to previous one, except that the CW is at now added, right? And the YTD represents the portion of the web that is under compression. So all the other dimensions could be written Y1 and Y2 are very similar to before. As usual, Y1 is the distance from the top flange to the PNA, and Y2 is the top flange, the distance from top flange to the center of the application of the compression force. The next step is to go ahead and write the balance of the forces, all the compression forces equal to all the tension forces. From there, you find the CW, and now you can get Y3 which is CW divided by the thickness of the web and by the yield capacity of the steel. And take the moment of all the forces with respect to that centroid, and you come up with this equation for the moment resistance in this special case. And as a reminder, I wrote what C and CF are. Okay? Now, the horizontal shear. By now, you notice that it is the tension force, which is ASFI minus 2CF minus 2CW, right at location, the tension forces right at the location of the top flange. That's where the, this value would be equal to the horizontal shear. Okay. So is there, an, just like previously, an alternate solution? Yes, you can resolve the forces again using the equations of statics, and you can find out exactly where this force, which is this is the actual tension, is located, and you can write a comparable equation for M. Now let's talk about shear connectors. Shear connectors are in the form of headed bars or pieces of channels welded to the top of the flange of the steel beam. Metal decking, when used, needs to be properly secured to the beam and allow welding of the shear connectors to the top flange. That's important. They need to be welded to the top flange of the beam. The strength of a headed bar used as a shear connector per AIAC is obtained from this equation. This has two terms in it. The first term, is related to concrete, the area of the stud multiplied by this factor, which is property of concrete. And this is related to property of the stud itself. Again, ASC is the area, uh, RG and RP are two factors. We talk about that. And FU is the ultimate strength, tensile strength of the stud. Right, because there are modes of failure that one is related to crushing of concrete, the other one related to the ultimate uh, tensile failure of a steel. We have to figure out which one is smaller. All right, ASC is a cross-sectional area of the connector in a square inches. For example, if you use a half an inch diameter connector, uh, that's uh, 0 0.2 square inches. A prime sub C compressive 
strength, but we use KSI uh, for concrete. EC modulus of elasticity of concrete, which is WC to the power of 1.5 square root of prime sub C. Now, what is this WC? WC is the density of concrete. We use pounds per cubic foot for it. However, for a prime sub C in this equation, we use KSI. The result is in KSI. And uh, uh, what is WC for normal weight concrete? It's about 150 pounds per cubic foot. For lightweight concrete, anywhere from 90, maybe 100 to 110. And FU is the minimum tensile strength of the shear connector. And uh, usually the value is around 60 KSI, 58 or 60 KSI. Now, what are the parameters RG and RP? These depend on the system configuration and whether metal decking is, whether metal decking is used and in what direction the metal decking is used. If no metal decking is used, then the two factors, each is equal to one. If decking is parallel to the steel beam, and for the condition, the WR over HR is larger than one and a half. Let me show you again what WR and HR are. In that case, RG is 1, RP is 0 0.75. Otherwise, it would be 0 0.85 and 0 0.75, as you can see listed here. Now, if taking is perpendicular to the steel beam, which is, by the way, preferred by many designers, because when the metal decking is perpendicular to the beam, AIC, of course, requires is, uh, securing the metal decking to the beam. But when it is perpendicular, it provides a lateral support for the beam. So during construction, you have almost full lateral support. If you're using parallel to the beam, you cannot rely on the decking as a lateral support. I'll talk about that in an example. If you're just using one stud per rib, then these are the factors, 1 and 0 0.6. If you are using double, like twin, two together, these are the factors. And if you're using three or more, which is pretty rare, you're using these factors. And uh, usually it's either one or two. Okay. There are variations from these. Sometimes AIC allows larger than these values depending on certain conditions, so consult with AIC. The equation that I gave you, uh, by the way, is for metal studs, bars, like bars, if you are using channels, you use a different equation. So please look at the AIC for equations when channels are used as connectors. All right, what I did for normal weight concrete and using ASCM 108 for these studs and uh, for different uh, diameters, uh, for three kinds of diameters, and these are pretty much the three that we can use, I uh, computed the values of uh, QN for 3 KSI concrete and 4 KSI concrete. But please notice that to certain points, the type of concrete really doesn't matter anymore. Look at here, for example, these values are pretty much the same. So it's more the, the material of the stud itself that contributes to the strength. Also notice that, for example, when we are using the metal decking perpendicular to the uh, direction of the beam, if there is one stud per rib, the value is 11.2. If you use two studs, it's 9.5. Now, it doesn't mean it is a small. This is per stud. And remember, there are two studs. So you're two times 9.5 you use in your equation. So this is a handy table. We're going to come back to this when we're going to do design for the connectors. There are certain requirements for the studs and the slab uh, thickness. The diameter of the stud uh, is limited to three quarters of an inch or smaller. Height above the top, as you can see in here, the top of the corrugated uh, or metal stud, if you have one at least one and a half inches. Uh, the stud, of course, are buried in concrete, but you need to have one and a half inches minimum 
protection cover at the top, concrete cover that is. A slab thickness, smallest value possible is two inches. Diameter of the stud has to be less than two and a half times the thickness of the top flange of the beam. Um, minimum spacing of the stud, center to center, six times the diameter of the studs, longitudinal, four times the diameter of the stud, transversal. If you are using decks that are run perpendicular to the beam, then both limits are four times the diameter of the stud. That's the absolute smallest possible spacing you can have. Maximum spacing center to center is 36 inches or eight times the slab thickness, whichever is smaller. So these are the limitations and make sure that when you design, uh, follow those. All right, let's look at some examples. Uh, we want to find the moment capacity of these systems. The thickness four inches, concrete type three KSI, effective width is 72, is a W16 by 26. We have metal decking, which has a height of 3.25. By the way, the minimum metal decking height is three inches. So we are almost like the minimum in this case. So we go to AIAC table and get the properties of this section. These are the values we need to use. So make sure to list them all. And we don't have to check this, but uh, nevertheless, I did it. Uh, H over TW, I got the H, H from the AIC table, and it is smaller than this limit. Okay, the first step is to determine the location of PNA. For that, you need Cmax, you need Tmax. I use the equations that I gave you before. As you can see, here we're talking about a larger value than that one. So, what's the condition? That's when PNA is located within the concrete slab. Uh, this is usually the case for most floor systems. The location of the PNA, I, I put my figure back again so we can make a reference to it, is distance A. So uh, notice that the T, the tension force, is actually the same as T max in this case. Therefore, we use our equation for A and you get 2.09 inches. That's A. Remember, the thickness is 4 inches. So you get Y2. And that's it. You get M and T times D over 2 plus Y2. And you're talking about 5,399 inch kips or 449.9 foot kips. And if you know phi B M N, just multiply by 0 0.9. All right, so I did it. So that is the factored resistance. All right, so what is the horizontal shear? In this case, sigma QN is ASFI. Let's design for connector. So let's use a half an inch diameter studs. Go over the table, the resistance for one, for one start, when the 3KSI concrete is used, 6.1. And if I use two starts per rib, it's 6.1, right? So you get two starts per rib. And therefore, N, the total number of uh, stars needed, is that horizontal shear multiplied by two times the strength of one, and you get 32 starts. So, this is, if it is a simply supported beam, this is over half of the span, right? So one half of the span requires 32, totally 64 studs will be needed. You can figure out what is the spacing by knowing the length of the beam. The problem didn't give us the length. So you, if you have the length, you compute what the spacing is and check the spacing with the requirements of the AIC. All right, let's look at uh, another example. In this case, we don't have any metal decking. The thickness of the slab is three inches and we have a W16 by 45. The effective width is 72, the HR is equal to zero. So I again went to AIAC and listed the properties of this section. This is satisfied, I don't have to check it, but I just, as a habit, I always do it. And uh, then the uh, first step is to determine the location of PNA. I compute the Cmax and compute the Tmax, and look at here. 
this is now larger. What does it mean? Well, that means PNA is located within this steel. So let's see how we can continue. I put the diagram back when the PNA is within the steel, but we don't know whether it is in the top flange or it is in the web. But let's say that this is a situation. So let's find CS first. Remember, it's ASFI minus C divided by 2, so you get 57.1. And the C flange, the maximum compression of the flange is 198.9. So what does it mean? This is smaller, so that means it is just like the figure that I have shown in here. It is in the top flange. So what do I do next? Well, find out what is Y1 by dividing CS by BFFI. So it is really extended very small amount into the flange. It's just about 0 0.162 inches below the top flange. So I compute the Y2 as I gave you before. I put it in the equation for MN and after multiplying by the reduction factor, I get 462.8 foot kips as a capacity in this case. All right, so the next question is, what is the horizontal shear? I gave you the equation, ASFI minus 2C sub C, 550.8. And uh, let's say, if I use now 3 quarters of an inch diameter to start for a prime sub C, going over the table, I get 21.3. Just one start per rib. And that gives me... 26 starts totally needed, again, if it is simply supported beam, over one half of the length of the beam. If it is not simply supported, you might say, is over what length? Is over, remember, point that bending moment is zero to where bending moment becomes maximum. So totally we need 52 starts. Again, find the spacing, check AIAC, those limits that I gave, make sure that you are following the requirements. All right, now what is the design procedure when we don't know what the steel beam we have? In that case, generally the slab configuration and the beam spacing are known. So we have that from architectural drawings, from experience, and therefore the parameters that are known, we can determine one is MU, you might say, I don't have the weight of the beam. How do I compute them? You just assume a value, maybe 60 pounds per linear foot, 70 pounds per linear foot, and continue with the calculations. We have this slab parameters. We know the thickness usually. We know what kind of slab. We know whether there is a metal decking or not. And uh, listen to this. Occasionally, we even know the depth of the steel beam. Even we don't know what size, but some architectural drawings and limitations of the ceiling tell us that this should be the depth of the beam. So sometimes you even know that. So if these are the case, uh, I've introduced two different methods. One is called, what I call it the conservative design. And it's based on the condition that PNA is within the concrete slab for a full composite action. This may end up with an over design especially for the shear connectors. And you use the maximum number of shear connectors to get the full com, uh, composite action. A more refined method is in AISC using tables. That would give a, a less conservative design and a design that is more comparable with the amount of moment that you have applied on the beam. So in this video, I'm talking about both these methods. Let's look at the conservative design process. You can use this without a need to go over the design aids. So you compute the loads on the beam and assume the value, as I said, for the self weight of the steel beam, then compute MU with load factors. If you know what depth you have for your beam, Assume A is equal to maybe one or maybe two inches, depending on the thickness. Usually I use two inches and find out what is the required area of the steel. So what I'm doing, just using the moment, you notice that I am dividing the uh, uh, MN by 
by 5 because this is the required uh, value for uh, uh, actually this is mu yeah, mu divided by phi. This is the required strength without the reduction factor. And uh, then uh, I'll uh, simply uh, dividing this by the uh, lever arm because A is already assumed. Assuming that the PNA is within the top flange, as you recall. If you don't have any value for the depth of the beam, and you really have no clue what the depth should be and have no experience, then simply use this equation. This is based on the uh, equilibrium of the forces, compression force divided by tension, and you solve it for AS. So now we know what area we need for our beam. So again, notice that the PNA is between the concrete slab. If the system is unsured, now this is important, Estimate the minimum required moment of inertia by limiting the deflection of the dead load only to 2.5 inches. Dead load consists of the weight of the concrete and estimated weight of the beam. All right. So how do I do that? Uh, if it is a simply supported beam, you know the equation for deflection and solve the equation for moment of inertia for 2.5 inches maximum deflection during construction. ES is a modulus of elasticity of steel and L is the length of the beam and make sure that you use inches and pounds in the entire equation, including the load QD. Usually it is pounds per foot, so divided by 12 uh, pounds per inch. And uh, then select a suitable section and compute the bending resistance phi m n. Make sure it is larger than m u. So that is pretty simple. Decide on the connector diameter and determine the number of shear connectors using the equation that we used before. If it is an onshore system, make sure the steel beam alone is able to sustain the dead load. And not only you check the deflection of it during construction, make sure that this beam is not composite yet. So is it able to take the dead load? Usually it does, but nevertheless, check it. And for all kinds of uh, decking, whether there is a decking or no decking, you need to check the deflection for the live load to make sure that it is less than L over 360, as I talked about. And for that, the easiest way is to either compute the moment of inertia uh, based on the what we call transform section, or more conveniently, use a value called ILB. LB means lower bound. Is a There are a series of tables, maybe two tables, I think, or maybe three in AIC called table 3-20. And this value is listed for different sections. You can use this value for computing deflection. Finally, make sure to check the shear. As I said, we don't talk about shear except for design of connectors, but this is the shear on the beam. When you check the shear, there is no composite action. It's just the steel beam alone that must take care of shear. So that's pretty straightforward. All right, now let's talk about design based on the AISC tables. These tables are designated as tables 3-19 in AISC. Very useful tool for designing the uh, composite sections for that. Of course, you always need MU. And uh, again, assume a value of self weight of the beam. Assume an initial value for parameter A and compute Y2. All right. Now, because in the limit we have the reduced capacity the same as MU, so we can use in MU in our equations. The AIC tables list the phi BMN based on the two parameters Y2 and seven different levels of parameters Y1. There are seven different levels of PNA. So 
these seven different values, two are for the PNA locations at the top and bottom of the flange of the steel beam, three within the flange, and two below the flange. The advantage of using AIC values is that they list the moment resistance independent of the slab dimensions. All you need is the slab thickness. You don't need to have B. So that's the good thing about the AIC tables. However, AIC doesn't encourage designing a system with the PNA below the level 7. That is corresponding to a tensile force of about 25% of FIAS. All right? So with the section that you select from the table, and I'll show you how it is done, you compute A, which is this equation. You might say, well, you never had A equal to this. But remember that sigma QN is the same as the tension force. So it's a tension uh, divided by pretty much uh, the value, the concrete value, in other words, tension equal to compression. And from there, you compute A. If this A that you find is less than the one you assume, that is it. You don't have to repeat any calculations. If it is larger than the A that you assume, that means you are, uh, you know, outside, or maybe outside of the concrete uh, or uh, the value, you know, the compression force now is a little bit larger, so you have to go back and revise your calculations. Probably pick up a larger section. All right? And uh, again, if it is, a situation that you have uh, no sure use in your design. So during construction, you want to make sure that deflection is not large. So the section you select must have a moment of inertia at least equal to this value. And the rest of the process is as before. You have sigma QN, which is also listed in the table, divided by the strength of one connector, and you design the number of connectors and and uh, also, as a check, during construction, if it is on short system, make sure that the steel itself has enough strength bending resistance to carry the bending moment applied because of the dead load. And that's very easy a step. And regardless of the type of the composite section, whether short, unsured, whether uh, with uh, metal decking or not, always check the deflection after the composite action is done. And for that, you can use the ILB that I talked about from tables 3-20 of AIC. Make sure that deflection for the live load only is less than L over 360, okay? And uh, don't forget to check this here as we talked before. So let's look at the design example. We are talking about uh, W section use a span is 36 feet, simply supported, 7.5 feet center to center spacing. The slab thickness is 4 inches, the rip height 3 inches. The slab uses normal weight concrete, a prime sub C4 KSI, FI50 for W sections. Metal decking is perpendicular to the steel section and no shores are used during construction. Live load 75 PSF. Of course, the dead load is because of the slab, but there is uh, uh, an additional dead load of 15 PSF using for the metal decking and the converting the estimated weight of the beam as a floor load, as, so that's about 15 PSF. All right, so let's do it for a typical interior beam. Uh, remember the equivalent B rather effective B, that becomes seven and a half feet, so it's 90 inches. We compute the loads for the live load, the tributary width is 7.5, so we get uh, 562 and a half pounds per linear foot. Weight of the slab is 150 pounds per cubic for normal weight, multiplied by the thickness divided by 12, so we get 50 pounds per square foot. I add to that, the additional dead load multiplied by tributary width, and I get the total dead load. All right. So if I use the dead load alone with the load factor of 1.4, I get this amount of moment. 
if I use a combination of dead load and live load, I get this moment. This is during construction. This is after. All right. So I, let's say I don't know what D is. So I use the second equation I gave you. And that is roughly the area I need. You don't have to really stick with this. You can go a little bit lower. And actually, that's what I'm going to do in this case. So, but before I do that, I also check with the construction, the deflection during construction. And uh, I realize that I need 254 uh, inches to the third as a moment of inertia. So when I pick up my section, I keep this number in mind. All right. So for, I can try a W14 by 38. It has an area a little bit less than what I need, but it has a moment of inertia. So since metal decking is perpendicular to the beam and properly secured to the top flange, the beam is considered adequately supported laterally during construction. And uh, uh, table 3-2 of AISC gives me the a bending resistance of the beam without the composite action. And so that's larger than the value during construction. So I'm okay. Now, here is a very important, I think I talked about it. If the decking is parallel to the steel beam, you cannot use the decking as a lateral support. It's ineffective. In that case, you need to have some temporary lateral supports or definitely you have to have a short system. All right, so let's figure out what's the situation here. C max I computed, T max I computed. It turns out PNA is within the concrete slab because C max is larger. And uh, now let's compute the value for A, Y2, and using the equation MN, I get MN as 613.2 foot kips, so a large amount of capacity. Now for this, you need to use also the maximum number of connectors. So definitely larger than what we need. And uh, using Sigma QN, which is ASFY in this case, and I use two starts per rib, three quarters of an inch diameter, I need to have 21 pairs of starts over half of the length. So 42 pairs total. That gives me full composite action. All right? It's a conservative design, right? Now let's look at AIC-based design. I'm going to assume A equal to 2. That's where we start. And therefore, I find Y2, which is 6. The total moment is 240.6, so I need to find what section has this much of a strength. For y2 equal to 6, the table is 3-19, and I pick up the appropriate condition for one of the 7 PNA that I talked about. I show you the table momentarily. I saw that there are two possibilities. I can use a 14 by 26, PNA location 6, and y2 is 6, it gives me this much a string. So I'm okay, compare it with that one. See that? And sigma qn listed is 96. I'm sorry, sigma qn is equal to 135 kips. Okay? And the 16 by 26 is another possible answer, but this one is at location, PNA location 7, and sigma qn is 96. Look at the strength. So we have a good section, and you can check either of the two. I'll check this, uh, try the second one and see what happens. I computed A and revised my Y2. And if I use a one half an inch diameter stud and one stud per rib, I only need 14 stars. So this is now not a full composite action. It's partial because the neutral axis is lower. And uh, nevertheless, it will provide the strength that you need. So here is a typical AIC table. I mark the value that I picked up for W16 by 26. You notice that PNA locations, there are seven of those. 
actually when you go across and here is a y2 you come down for 6 is 252 that I picked up for LRFD now don't use ASD LRFD and also you notice that the Sigma Q is listed as 96 and for this condition the y1 is equal to 6 so is extended certainly below this left so that's how these tables are used all right so learn these tables uh, let's look at these studs spacing over the half of the length of the beam so 18 multiplied by 12 14 needed so there are 13 spacings and there is 16.6 .6 inches of spacing so if I can put like 16 and a half spacing that should be fine and minimum spacing is four times diameter so I'm okay maximum spacing is 36 or eight times thickness of the slab which is 32 so I'm okay therefore the spacing is okay however I need to use at least four and a half inches for the length of the stud because of this minimum that we need okay uh, let's look at the live load deflection I use table 3-20 of AIC for this W section and because y2 is equal to 6.8 6.8 uh, is not listed but there is 6.5 and 7 so I did an interpolation level is 7 I show you the table with the interpolation I get 631 inches to the uh, uh, fourth uh, so that's the unit for I I mentioned inches to the three before but no the unit for IB is inches to the fourth uh, uh, sorry for that uh, mistake I had earlier but use the equation for deflection of the live load again use inches and uh, you have to be less than L over 360 so you're okay and here is a table for what we call the ILB moment of inertia you notice that the Y2 is listed for the section that we selected we are level 7 but we don't have 6.8 so I have these two values 1 for 6.5 1 for 7 I did the interpolation in between all right so I just put this illustration to show you how our design would look like we got the steel beam we got the corrugated sheet we got the studs and our design is completed all right now the last the board and uh, if I want to find the <laughs> section properties <coughs> excuse me uh, using the transform section what do I do find the ratio of the modulus of elasticity of a steel to concrete we call it n reduce the compression area by this factor by dividing the area by that factor but we do not touch the thicknesses we kept the thicknesses as they are the four inches and three inches we only reduce the width so from 90 divided by n we get 9.51 all right and then find the centroid using the equations of statics now if you uh, would like to know how it is done please uh, watch lesson uh, 20 of my structure engineer made simple I have a procedure in there how to find the centroid and moment of inertia section modulus etc for any built-up section so for this one our case n is equal to 9.46 and uh, for W 16 by 26 I need the moment of inertia and area for that compression block I have its area and the moment of inertia using the procedure in lesson 20 I come up with the location of the centroid from the bottom at 18.54 and I get the moment of inertia as this much so certain cases you can use this and you can also use this in finding the stresses and find the capacity this would be the section that I mentioned before called transform section in bridges when composite beam systems are used one potential failure mode for the shear connectors is fatigue and happens as a result of repeated load applications P 
Elise consulted with the pertinent bridge design manual for designing shear connectors for fatigue. For steel beams with H over TW larger than the limit we talked about, compute MN based on the superposition of elastic stresses. For that, you need to find the moment resistance using yield strength as a limited state for steel and a cross section based on the transform section described in my previous slide. Thank you for watching this video.